you with me. I, I want to go now to Ambassador Christopher Hill, joining me on the phone. He was the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and Pacific Affairs under President George W. Bush. Ambassador Hill, when you heard this, what was your reaction? Should Trump have had this conversation with the President of Taiwan? Well, obviously, he should not have. We have had for 40 years rather clear policies of how to implement the one China policy. Eight years during the Reagan administration, this never happened. Four years during the uh, Bush senior administration, this never happened. Eight years of Clinton, eight years of George W. Bush, and eight years of Obama. So this is a real break. Obviously, it was a it was uh, an example of what is all too often happening now with this incoming administration, this tendency to wing it. What I'm concerned about is that rather than acknowledge a mistake, uh, they will double down on it, say that this is indeed an effort to change some of the terms of our one China yeah. policy. And that's a huge mistake. We have a lot of stuff going on with China. We've got well, South China Sea. We've got North Korea. We don't need this right and, now. And, Ambassador, you know, to your point about them doubling down, this was not a mistake. I mean, we know a pro-Taiwan advisor of Trump's team who worked closely with Dick Cheney facilitated this phone call, right? It was purposeful. We know no one in the Trump camp consulted the White House or the State Department before the phone call was made. Was it done on purpose in secret? Well, I, I, I do know the individual you're talking about, Steve Yates. He, uh, he worked for Dick Cheney, and he worked on Taiwan, and he, you know, beavered away with really a concept that there was no such thing as the People's Republic of China. Well, there is, and this shouldn't have been done. And uh, whether it was Steve Yates trying to organize this, there should have been someone in the transition, perhaps the National Security Advisor, say, wait a minute, let's uh, think this through. And clearly, there's just too much of this kind of winging it and this kind of deinstitutionalization that's going on, that is, why ask the State Department? Why ask the National Security Council staff? Uh, why not just go ahead because it feels right? And this is not going to be the uh, last of these kinds of things. So uh, things need to get cleaned up and cleaned up in a hurry in Washington. Ambassador Hill, thank, oh, you, thank you very much uh, for your time. A combustible mix of raw emotions and hard feelings, as top advisors to Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton came face to face for the first time since the election. The Clinton team bluntly accusing the Trump campaign of fueling racism to help win the White House. If providing a platform for white supremacists makes me a brilliant tactician, I am crap. glad to have <laughs> lost. I would rather lose than win the way you guys did. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Yes. No, you wouldn't. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. No, you That's very clear yeah. today. No, you wouldn't, respectfully. Absolutely. Clinton Communications Director Jennifer Palmieri and Trump campaign manager Kellyanne Conway tangling over Steve Bannon, Trump's chief strategist and former executive of Breitbart News, a website popular with the alt-right movement. And it is a very very important moment in our history as our country and I think as you know his presidency goes forward I'm going to be very glad to have been part of the campaign that tried hey, Jen, to do you think do you think I ran a campaign where white supremacists had a platform Are you gonna look me in the face and tell me that it did Kelly really did. do you think you could have just had a decent message upset. for the white working class voters do you think this woman who has nothing in common with I'm not anybody saying that's a post-mortem on the presidential race a staple of every campaign since 1972 erupted in this series of extraordinary exchanges at the Institute of Politics at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. The advisors looked one another squarely in the eye across a table as they argued about Clinton winning the popular vote and Trump the Electoral College. It's hard to say we lost popular vote, so that means we didn't no, do the, as well. No. And there was Total nothing context. that said the road to popular vote anywhere. Is Kellyanne, to I'm not. I That's started, I be. premised my statement by saying you that. Hey, okay, guys, we won. You don't have to respond. Okay, I mean, seriously, no. hold on. What, why is there no mandate? You've lost 60 congressional seats since President Obama got there. You got lost more than a dozen senators, a dozen governors, 1,000 and state legislators. You just reelected a guy who represents liberal New York and a woman who represents San Francisco as your as your leaders. You learned nothing from this election. The forum, a civil academic exercise in most elections, is intended to write a first draft of history of the campaign. Amid the shouting, the conversation offered a window into why Trump aides believe he won, despite a string of offensive comments. One thing that was missed all along in this election is something that we noticed early on, which is there's a difference to voters between what offends you and what affects you. And why Clinton aides acknowledge struggling. Voters overwhelmingly wanted change. And we, we saw that, I think anybody looking at the race saw that. 
And obviously that did create some headwinds for Hillary. After the off-camera discussion, Conway and Mook sat down with CNN's Jake Tapper for a conversation appearing Sunday on State of the Union. We cannot have foreign uh, and foreign aggressors, I would argue, intervening uh, in our elections. And we know that the Russians were promulgating fake news through Facebook and other outlets. I think the biggest piece of fake news in this election was that Donald Trump couldn't win. So there's that. Both you and your Brexit team uh, and uh, Mr. Trump, President-elect Trump, and a small part of his uh, political base have been criticized for being bigots, for being xenophobes. By no means am I saying that everybody who voted for Brexit is that way or that even a mass vast majority of the people who voted for Donald Trump are that way, but there is this element. Um, why do you think they are attracted to um, to the, to the Brexit forces and to the, to the Trump forces? Well, if I look at Europe as a whole and look at the, you know, the, the Eurosceptic movements that are saying the euro is a bad thing, that control from Brussels is a bad thing, they're manifesting themselves on left and right. You know, it is, it is, it is a left-wing party, uh, for example, in Greece that won the election and there are you know, right-wing parties in the north of Europe. Look, if you take away from people their democratic rights, their feeling that they're in control of their own future, they will go anywhere they can. Uh, you know, to try and find a solution. I can say this to you, hand on heart, when we debated Brexit, you know, we didn't even mention Islam. We didn't even talk about some of those cultural issues. What we did talk about was that it's sensible to control borders, it's sensible to vet who comes to your country, and I would reject utterly and totally any allegations of deliberately pandering to extremism. And I was pleased that Donald Trump did, you know, talk, you know call these people down and say stop it. But the, you did talk about immigration and you did talk course, about refugees. But, but yeah. that's a respectable thing to do. And we, you know, we got to such a crazy place where actually, I was told 10 years ago, oh, Nigel, please, when you go on television, don't talk about immigration, don't talk about border controls. Only bad people do this. And what, and what we've had to do is shift the center of political gravity and mean that we do talk about it and do so sensibly. Back to business at Trump Tower, hours after returning to those rousing rallies on the first stop of what Trump is calling his thank you tour. We're going to make America great again. You watch. The president-elect holding court for hundreds in Cincinnati, part on teleprompter, part off the cuff, bombastic, boastful, with the clear message, I told you so, all signature Trump. We won Wisconsin, and we won Michigan, and we won Pennsylvania, and that person is doing the map, and that person was saying for months that there's no way that Donald Trump can break the blue wall, right? We didn't break it, we shattered that sucker. Trump lashing out at the media. These are very, very dishonest people. And boasting about his nine-point Ohio win despite a non-endorsement from Governor John Kasich. Your Governor John Kasich called me after the election. He said, congratulations, that was amazing. And at a time when many are calling for the president-elect to reach out to the plurality of voters who voted for his opponent, Trump went in the other direction. Although we did have a lot of fun fighting Hillary, didn't we? Okay. <laughs> While also calling for the country to come together. We're going to seek a truly inclusive society where we support each other. Trump's rifts are resulting in confirmation of reports from CNN and others that he'll nominate retired Marine General James Mattis as Secretary of Defense on Monday. They say he's the closest thing to General George Patton that we have, and it's about time. But at least one Democrat promising a fight over the congressional waiver necessary for General Mattis to take over the top post at the Pentagon. New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand releasing this statement. While I deeply respect General Mattis's service, I will oppose a waiver. Civilian control of our military is a fundamental principle of American democracy, and I will not vote for an exception to this rule. Mattis left the Marines in 2013. Not enough time to meet the seven years required by law between a uniformed officer retiring and taking up up a civilian post. Meanwhile, speculation still swirling over who Trump will pick for Secretary of State. Mitt Romney continuing to stand out as one of the four leading contenders for the spot after his Tuesday night dinner with Trump. The president-elect providing some insight into his relationship with the former Massachusetts governor, who infamously labeled Trump a fraud during the primary fight. Well, he's been very gracious. And don't forget, I hit Mitt pretty hard also, I mean, before the fact. And so I understand how it all works. But uh, 
He's been very, very nice. We had dinner the other night. It was great. There was actually a good chemistry. Joining us now with reaction, Delaware Democratic Senator Chris Coons. Let's start with those comments from Congressman Gutierrez. First of all, do you think that's appropriate? Do you think many Democrats will boycott Trump's inauguration? And will you? Well, Chris, I'm planning to go to the inauguration. Uh, I think uh, regardless of how you feel about uh, the election or who won, uh, we owe it to our nation and to the world uh, to show that we're going to participate in the orderly, peaceful, regular transition of power that has happened every four years throughout the entire history of our republic. Uh, I think this is an important moment uh, for us to show uh, our country and the world uh, that democracy works, uh, that we embrace the outcome of the election and the chance to work together across the aisle. I choose to follow what I think has been the example of both President-elect Trump uh, in his victory speech on the night of the election and then President Obama and Secretary Clinton in saying uh, we all look for President-elect Trump to be successful. Well, I applaud you for your consistency, but not all of your uh, fellow Democrats are being so consistent. And, you know, and I remember I was the moderator of the third debate, and I asked Mr. Trump whether he would recognize the results of the election. He said, I'm going to keep you in suspense. Hillary Clinton said that was horrifying. People, Democrats, liberals, uh, said they were horrified about uh, the, citing the principle of the peaceful transfer of power. Now, though, that it's Trump, who's the president, not all of them are sticking to that principle. Well, I think what concerned folks uh, in that debate with that, I'll keep you in suspense, was the possibility that Trump, if he were unsuccessful in the election, uh, would contest it, not through legal orderly means, but would refuse to accept it. But now you've got the Green Party calling for recounts in three states, the Clinton campaign mm -hmm. saying they're going to participate. Isn't this hypocrisy? Um, well, I think what's different there, what's distinguishable, uh, is that Jill Stein, who's the presidential candidate of the Green Party, let's right. be clear, um, is following a legal process uh, to file uh, contests against uh, those three states' elections and asking for a recount. That's quite different from saying you refuse to accept the outcome. Speaking for myself, um, I accept the outcome of the election. Um, I think it's clear that Secretary Clinton won the popular vote and that Donald Trump won the Electoral uh, College, and he's going to be our next president. Uh, and I think we need to move forward past this election. What do you think of moving forward? What do you think of the Trump agenda as he's laid it out so far, especially at that carrier event yesterday in Indiana on this issue of really being tough on companies leaving the United States? Well, there's been some criticism of that. I think the editorial board of The Wall Street Journal said from a sort of a, a conservative economic policy perspective uh, that they don't want the president jawboning specific companies. Uh, but I'll tell you, if, if I had family that were working at that carrier plant, I'd be pleased uh, that their jobs were, for now, saved. Um, what I'd like to see is us coming up with a, a, a concrete bipartisan agenda uh, for strengthening manufacturing in the United States. And if we focus on uh, improving infrastructure and improving the skills of our workforce and uh, making our country a more attractive place for investment, I think there's a chance we can grow manufacturing employment. In this One country. more issue. What do you think of the choice of retired General James Mattis for Secretary of Defense? Will you vote to give him the waiver because he has not been out of the military for seven years? Will you vote to confirm? Well, I was very encouraged uh, by his nomination. I've talked to a number of friends who are Marine Corps veterans who know him from service uh, and who've said very positive things about him as someone uh, who reads a great deal, uh, who served more than four decades in the Marine Corps and has uh, personal experience uh, both as a combat commander uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq uh, and is knowledgeable about the challenges and, that we face in the world. And real quick, do you have a problem giving him the waiver? Um, I understand some of my colleagues are raising a question about uh, civilian control of the military. It's been more than 50 years since we've given such a waiver. I'll consider it. Um, but I think it's important uh, that President-elect Trump surround himself with a national security team with the kind of experience uh, and character and um, success in the battlefield uh, that General Mattis has demonstrated. Senator Coons, thank you. Always good to talk with you, sir. Great to be with you. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. A cavalcade of candidates filed into Trump Tower again today with a few surprises there. The president-elect is slowly filling in the blanks on the list of his key advisors. We also may be getting a better indication of how Donald Trump plans to present himself as president. And we are seeing and hearing just how bitter the defeat remains for some in Hillary Clinton's campaign. Correspondent Peter Ducey is live outside Trump Tower again tonight. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Brett. And a big surprise late this afternoon, early this evening, came when Governor Chris Christie popped out of Trump Tower's elevator unannounced. Christie's visit here comes as his name is floated as a possible next RNC chairman. But the big work of the day here in Midtown at Trump Tower was filling key cabinet slots. 
Another name from the Secretary of State short list was on the Trump Tower guest list today. Former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and Fox News contributor John Bolton. His first meeting with the President-elect about the possibility of becoming America's top diplomat. Today we also heard for the first time what it is that Mr. Trump now likes about another contender for the job in Foggy Bottom, Mitt Romney. Well, he's been very gracious. And don't forget, I hit Mitt pretty hard also, I mean, before the fact. And so I understand how it all works. But uh, he's been very, very nice. We had dinner the other night. It was great. There was actually a good chemistry. It was a really good chemistry with him. Mr. Trump says an announcement will come soon, and that may have his senior staff on their toes because some of them say the mention of a General James Mattis nomination last night in Ohio. He's the closest thing to General George Patton that we have, and it's about time. Was a complete surprise. We did not have a clue that he would do that at that moment. I didn't anyway, uh, but that's okay. Vice President-elect Mike Pence is telling the Wall Street Journal the Trump administration plans to aggressively pursue big-ticket campaign promises with a focus on health care and immigration, saying that, quote, I think the only thing that will surprise them is that Washington, D.C. is going to get an awful lot done in a short period of time. And part of the transition process is figuring out how. That's why Republican Senator David Perdue Due from Georgia came to New York today. I committed my position in the Senate to some full support about getting this 100-day uh, plan executed. Other guests included former Defense Secretary Robert Gates, Florida Attorney General Pam Bondi, and North Dakota Senator Heidi Heitkamp, who joins Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard as the only elected Democrats to meet with the incoming president, and who is the only elected official we've seen sharing an elevator car with famous New York street performer, the Naked Cowboy. The transition in New York has been completely civil, but when Trump and Clinton staff met for a conversation in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there was chaos. I would rather lose than win the way you guys did. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Yes. A forum held every four years at Harvard's Institute of Politics between winning and losing political operatives soured last night when Clinton Communications Director Jennifer Palmieri accused Trump campaign manager Kellyanne Conway of catering to white supremacists because she works in the same office as the polarizing former Breitbart CEO Steve Bannon. And Conway fought back. Do you think I ran a campaign where white supremacists had a platform? Are you going to look me in the face and tell me that? It did. Kelly and really? did. Oh, we that's how you lost. Fresh off the big job-saving carrier announcement, the president-elect told us today that he is going to start relying on a forum of CEOs to advise him while he tries to bring jobs back to the United States from companies like Disney, Walmart, and GE. Brett. Peter, every day or so we get a new list of world leaders President-elect Trump has talked to, but today in particular, one particular call is raising some eyebrows here in Washington and probably in another world capital. Right, and that's because the president-elect spoke on the phone we learned just a few minutes ago with the president of Taiwan. It's the first time in nearly four decades that a, an American president or president-elect has spoken to a president of Taiwan because we haven't had diplomatic relations with them in that entire time. The transition office says that the two spoke about the close economic, political, and security ties between the U.S. and Taiwan, but this is possibly going to start causing some problems with China, which disagrees very strongly with Taiwan about their status as a province. We don't know if this means that there's going to be a new China policy already, if this is a hint of what it is. But remember, China was a major target of Mr. Trump on the campaign trail, especially when he talks about global economic problems he thinks are caused by their manipulation of currency. Fred? Yeah, that's one to watch. And just to be clear, uh, the naked cowboy is not under consideration for a position. They are tight-lipped about his status <laughs> okay. as a possible cabinet member. I had to clarify that. Peter, thank you.